Rock Hill. It is 5.30 and time for our next Parent Academy. We're so glad you've joined us, particularly because we have spring break coming up, but we have an outstanding guest. My name is Dr. Nancy Turner, and I am your director of behavioral mental health for our Rock Hill schools. We also have our co-host with us tonight, Miss Cindy Taubin Kimmel. Good evening, Cindy. Good evening, Dr. Turner, and good evening, Rock Hill. As Dr. Turner said, my name is Cindy Talvin Kimmel, and I'm the director at ParentSmart, Rock Hill Schools Parent Education Partnership, where parents are at the heart of education. Just love hearing you. And it is so true. Tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce an extraordinary guest presenter, Madison Tarleton. She's been completing her doctoral capstone experience through Wingate University with the Behavioral and Mental Health Department under my supervision. And she has brought with her experience in occupational therapy, but gained knowledge and mental health perspective. And we have been so excited to have her. She's been a joy to work with. We still have you for another month or so. So let me tell you a little bit about Madison Tarleton. Madison is a Rock Hill native. She completed a doctoral of occupation. She is, well, she is in the process of completing a doctoral of occupational therapy degree at Wingate University. She graduated from Limestone University in spring 2001, but may I say, which is not on here, you are a Northwestern high graduate. Is that correct? All right. Had to throw that in. All right. <laughs> She has a bachelor's degree in health science with minors in psychology, biology, and business. She will be graduating this May after completing her capstone project. She's completing this experience in the behavioral mental health department under, yes, me, Dr. Turner, including our day treatment and other experiences throughout Rock Hill Schools. Her experiences in occupational therapy services include fieldwork rotations with McLeod Health in Shaw, North, uh, South Carolina, and lively therapy services in Kannapolis, North Carolina. She aims to work in pediatrics while specializing in mental, mental health following graduation. Please welcome Ms. Madison Tarleton. Thank you, Dr. Turner. <laughs> Where is Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Turner, for that awesome introduction. Um, I have a little bit more about myself, but today we're going to be covering the topic of occupational therapy and mental health. So here's all of my little bio that Dr. Turner just read. But I also have special certifications in suicide prevention, Narcan training, and I also have um, a certification in crisis prevention as well. Um, I'm also a member of North and South Carolina Associations for Occupational Therapy, the, our national organization, as well as my school-specific memberships for diversity and inclusion, which we called COTAD which is the Coalition of Occupational Therapy Advocates for Diversity, as well as our Student Occupational Therapy Association. And I'm also a member of Chi Alpha Sigma, which I was inducted to at Limestone for my academic excellence in sports. So my objectives for today's presentation is to introduce occupational therapy to you, our role in mental health, identify common diagnoses that mental health has, as well as the student-based sensory needs and strategies you can use with your um, children or even with yourself, and then educate you on the importance of understanding your overall, overall wellness as a parent and making modifications for that at, for your children. So we're gonna start with what is occupational therapy? Um, if you have any questions throughout my presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, I will have a time at the end to answer anything if you need so. I'll remind you throughout the middle if you join in later, but that is that. So occupational therapy overall is the 
way to enable people to, of all ages to participate in daily living. So our overall purpose as OTs is to improve that person's overall quality of life, whether that activity is a simple bathing, dressing, brushing their teeth, or even washing their clothes. So sorry, I was moving things. But at the end of the day, it's what can help you be the most successful in your daily life. So areas that you can see occupational therapy are in hospitals, schools, nursing homes, home health. Um, we're going to be talking about schools, but also how you can incorporate occupational therapy into your day to day without having to be referred to OT or identifying signs. So the picture at the bottom right corner is our association's logo. So it's our national organization that we're certified through. And I'll give you their information at the end to, if you want to learn more. So our OT services. So as we go through our day-to-day -day interventions with individuals, we start off with a personalized evaluation. So we go into the clinic or the school or the hospital room, and we com we complete what is called an occupational profile. This is where we learn about your beliefs, what is important to you, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So do you have a certain schedule you follow? Um, do you have any family members? What kind of support system do you have? And just what makes you you as a person and how can we help you get back home as quick and fast as possible, or where can we work from where you are to make your life even better? So based on that evaluation, we go through um, a unique intervention plan. So that is where we set your goals, let you know what we can do for you and how we plan to get there. Um, and as we go through your intervention, we take those goals and make outcomes that we want to achieve. So we place numbers, percentages, stuff like that on it. But at the end of the day, we want you to become 100% independent at the level that you can function. Because as occupational therapists, we interact with people that are intellectually disabled, have mental health diagnoses, are physically disabled. Um, we also interact with the geriatric population. So if that person is just grown of age and they need help organizing their day, we help do that. So occupational therapy and mental health specifically, I'm having a wonderful time at the day treatment center, incorporating it in a daily activity way. Typical OT in a school base is referred to within the special education system, but we use, with my program I've been creating, we use day-to-day -day activities such as pottery, painting, stuff of that nature, which has been awesome. So here's an overall scope of OT and mental health, we of course have a ton of little objects on the screen, but we're going to focus on the center bubble with the client in the middle and then the surrounding bubble around it. So these are all the different areas. Us as OT are client centered. That means we use your diagnoses. We use your goals to cater to your improvement as you go along. So we do home and community. Those are those routines that we can do Outside of the school, we do population health and wellness. That is doing your positive mental health and that prevention intervention is very popular in that area. We also have academia and research that we work with. So how can we encourage individuals to find the research, but also perform and be a part of research studies to help further our literacy then we also are a part of the unhoused community of helping people organize homeless shelters, making community drive events, or getting people in touch if they have a family member impacted by homelessness as well. Like I mentioned, we're also in hospitals and long-term care. So those are really heavily dedicated to ADLs. So an ADL is a activity of daily living, which is that bathing, dressing, things of that nature. Then of course we have our traditional outpatient clinic. This is where you're typically referred to either from a school or from a doctor. 
and you go get services outside of the doctor's office that you're currently in, or if you were in a hospital, you would be for, referred to an outpatient clinic. Then we have an acute hospital, which is extreme traumas, such as amputations, burns, things of that nature. And then we want to focus on schools, early intervention, and community education. That's where I want to focus all of it today as well. So we collaborate with educators and parents, and we observe for early prevention. So when we're in the schools, we want to help with promoting that transition. If that student has an intellectual disability, or even if they're transitioning from one school to another, an occupational therapist is very helpful in that transition as they help with scheduling and things of that nature. Um, we also consider their environment that they're coming from and going into and the trauma that they have experienced beforehand. While I do think occupational therapy is a good place for this, we also have in place in the school district other personnel that are able to do that as well. This is just a tool. And then we also want to promote the overall all well-being of the student or you as well if being a part of this entire process. So we also have OT in a mental health setting. In general, I want to talk about the common mental health diagnoses that are seen by occupational therapists, which would include anxiety, depression, and disordered eating, as all three of these majorly affect the way that you do your day-to-day -day task. This is not a conclusive list at all, as there are plenty diagnoses that individuals can experience along the course of their lifetime. So other ones include ADHD. That's a very common one with students, as well as schizophrenia or even um, examples of psychosis. But we also work with individuals who are experiencing suicidal ideation or experiencing self-harm. But at the end of the day, all the occupational therapists are working towards is getting you to the best version of you and working towards that. So we're going to talk about each one of those three individually. So we're going to start with anxiety. Um, anxiety is that feeling of fear or dread or uneasiness. It's commonly referred to as the butterflies in your stomach. That is a a physical representation of what anxiety can look like if you needed an example, but your child may pre be presenting or maybe even you are presenting with an excessive amount of worry. Um, you're just not processing your information that you're receiving from outside very well or your attention span is decreased or even your child's attention span. These children also experience low motivation for sleep hygiene. This sleep hygiene can be either your sleep pattern, like how long you're sleeping, when you're sleeping, the range of sleep you're getting, or even the process of getting in the bed. So that schedule that you're creating for um, your nightly rest. These children or even maybe others may experience social isolation or low self-esteem. So when school teachers impact um, can have a major impact on anxiety as they can help students prepare. They can give them a list and give them chores. And I know our teachers around the district are working really hard to help children battle anxiety every day. I'll give you a couple examples of what OT is doing or they could do if your child needs it or maybe even you want to explore this avenue. So we help identify and manage anxiety triggers this can be a situation that you are in. It can be for kids, it's commonly around testing. That's the highest one or even social interactions with their peers. So then we also have their learn and practice, their emotional regulation and coping strategies. A frequent OT tool used for coping is breathing. So breathing in, holding it, and then breathing out. Uh, we also help deliver those routines for um, or develop those routines for students inside of school. Say they have so many activities on their plate, they have sports, they have um, all their homework. How can we help manage that time effectively to remove that? 
as I mentioned before, we help improve sleep patterns and quality. That's a huge one for anxiety, but also all mental health diagnoses, um, as well as preparing for and participating in social activities. Social activities can be listed as recess if the child is of age, just don't have a recess at school, sporting events, lunch is considered a social activity, any club that you participate in. So as an adult, this would be your interactions with people at the grocery store, or even while you're driving, even though you're not physically talking to someone, that social anxiety of someone else being in the car beside you is a good example. And then we also have the ability to talk and strategize with the people who are prescribing that medication and how can we get the students in contact with the right person to help if we believe they may need med medication. And then at the end of the day, we also help increase confidence and in all students or even the people that we work with in the older population as well. Depression is our next one. So depression is that constant feeling of sadness or loss of interest in an activity. Um, symptoms you might be experiencing or you might witness from your children may be a depressed mood, a loss of interest in that activity, possible weight gain or loss, fatigue and loss of energy, that feeling of worthlessness and unwarranted guilt that you may feel from a certain situation, a lowered ability to think or concentrate, and possible suicidal ideation. Um the CDC released a study showing that 21% of our youth, which are the ages of 12 to 17, experience a major depressive episode by the time that they graduate. Um, and the kids that I work with right now are of that main age. And it's so important to give them a space to feel like they can open up and express um, their emotions, even if it's not the best emotion. And then being able to talk that through. The example of the fit, uh, the picture I have is from NAMI, which is showing a high functional lead depression um, individual. So that's the image of looking okay, but also having all of those inner feelings that are just weighing you down. And creating that space would be a great opportunity to work on that. Us as OTs, um, we decide or we work through recognizing and managing stress. We learn strategies for planning and coping necessary tasks. So creating those schedules, making the list of these are the emotions I have and even being able to express, oh, I'm feeling really down today. Or a popular one that we do with our kids is doing the zones of regulation. So green is a really positive mood. You're happy. You are you have joy, you find um, excitement in what you're doing. We have yellow, which is more of the anxiety, you're feeling uneasy, but it can also include, ex it also includes excited, but to where there's extreme excitement um, or feeling silly and wiggly as well. Then we also have the red zone, which is where the anger and all of that comes in. So being able to identify which zone you're in is very helpful for students. Um, but it could also help you. So if you have a family chart in your house saying these are the zones we're in and they, your kids, maybe they're not the best at communicating those feelings or maybe you guys just need that visual for yourselves, creating that on the wall and just having your kids stick where they are that day would help a lot. Um, so that's part of our creating um, techniques as well. But we create techniques to simplify schedules with depression. So, for example, if you were stressed about cleaning your entire house. How do we break down that to give that task an easier way of being performed? For example, I would say as your OT, I would say, let's go to the kitchen and clean the kitchen instead of thinking about the entire house as a whole. But for some individuals that depression symptom overwhelms them still, and that's still too big of a task. So we break it down even further. So instead of cleaning just the kitchen, we're gonna just clean the sink. And then creating those small tasks gives you an opportunity for little wins that build your confidence to complete a greater task. So as we continue through depression um, and those interventions, we like to improve sleep patterns as well. People with depression are commonly um, referred to as they're just lazy. They just sleep all the time. They don't really want to do their work, but it's a psychological event that's occurring. So acknowledging and creating that space for those where you can create that open communication of 
I'm sleeping all the time because I don't feel well, would really benefit the child. Along with depression, um, they always suggest to increase physical activity. I know this is, can be hard as our days are busy and packed with all kinds of activities, but finding a way, maybe even going outside for a couple minutes, going on a walk together, so at least all of you are doing an activity, or having the kids, if maybe it's not the best neighborhood, having them in the backyard or doing a workout inside. Due to COVID, there's plenty of workouts that you can do inside. It doesn't even have to be a workout. It can just be standing in the kitchen, walking around more, and just getting out of the room that they want to lay in. Um, then we have the different plans that we can have. So hobby and leisure activities. Maybe you're not the most interested in exercise. So finding um, like a pottery, painting, um, poetry is a really big one that I found to be successful with younger kids as instead of communicating that to a parent, they're more likely to write it out in a song or a verse and willing to present it when they create that trust within that relationship to share it. And then we have into seeking social support and interaction with the family and coworkers. So we create that space for children to feel comfortable, but also connecting them with the right people. If we are not the ones that they feel comfortable talking to, we work on social skills and interactions with others and which relationships are healthy or not. Um, and then we also have those developing the strategies for medication as well, because depression is um, one that can be medicated and we refer them as they are needed. We also have disordered eating on the list for things that occupational therapy goes into. So disordered eating is a sliding spectrum. Um, when people hear, hear disordered eating, they become very worried, but it's any change in your eating that is over a long period of time. So restrictive eating, compulsive eating, and irregular and flexible eating patterns are types of disordered eating that can be included, but there are always levels of severity. So for example, if you are watching a football game or Super Bowl weekend and you eat like 50 chicken wings, like that is not considered an eating disorder. That's just you having a one time thing. But if you were eating 50 chicken wings every other day for seven days, that's the beginning of something that might need to be addressed, depending on the mood that you're expressing, as well as the um, amount of socialization you're having. So if you're going out on events with other people that just so happens to be what you're eating, that's completely different than you're staying in your room, you're ordering in, you're not going anywhere else. Um, but restrictive eating and compulsive eating are different because restrictive eating on a severe scale is anorexia where you've restricted all of your food intake and that can be really dangerous to the body. Compulsive eating is normally based on a emotion. So it's when you're eating because you're bored, you're eating because you're stressed. A typical example that I like to use is when you have the candy bowl on your desk and you're feeling stressed about an exam or a meeting that you might have. So you're just eating all the candy in the bowl and, and you're not actually hungry. Um, but also creating that space for disordered eating with occupational therapy intervention is making that food um, less scary if that's the case, but also identifying why that food is their comfort food if they are having that compulsive eating or irregular eating pattern. So I also have the interventions listed for this. So there are the goals that we as occupational therapy do, and then we have the plans, of course. And how do we measure these interventions are a little different because disordered eating is dependent on a pattern and when you take a lot of trust with the parent. So this one really does start at home with, are you providing the, the child with the food that they need? Or are you providing yourself with the food that you need to have enough energy to complete the rest of your day? Um, so as you work with an occupational therapist, whether it's for you or with your child, they'll help you manage those skills of well-being and engage you in different self-esteem activities because a lot of eating disorders are tied to a confidence or another mental health diagnosis, such as depression. So the compulsive eating happens because we're depressed about the situation we have going on and finding the root of that is the biggest part of that.
So we also identify a plan on how to manage social situation or potential triggers. Um, this is seen as a thing with um, individuals with social gatherings, so sorry. And they need, if they're recovering, they may not be the most comfortable with eating out with others and modifying the way that they interact is the first step. So maybe they're eating at home and they have one friend come over and then it's two friends and then build up to going out to where they're comfortable. Um, now, does that work with the way that family life goes when your kid has a soccer game or all of that? No, it's all about finding that sweet spot for your family. That's why if you do end up working with an OT, it's good that they have an individual intervention plan for you to work on that. So we also adapt the home and work environment for recovery. And then my favorite one for individuals with eating disorders, whether they are younger or older, is managing that food shopping, preparing and eating the meals. Um, I had a lot of babies who were having difficulty feeding. So my favorite thing to do with them is um, food play. So how can parents create a meal where the kid is not endangering themselves so they don't really have food that's too sharp or too thick for the food that they need to eat? But how can we prepare a meal that is safe for them and also engaging them in all the play that they need to? But with older individuals who are going through either a recovery or they're just struggling with food shopping in general because they're counting calories or the types of food that they don't like because they're a picky eater, you just also work through a simulation with them. You don't have to go to an actual grocery store as an occupational therapist. We're very nifty in that sense. But the favorite one is to do um, the little toy grocery stores and simulate that shopping experience. So now that we have that covered, we're going to go through the sensory system in mental health. Um, so what is the sensory system? The sensory system function is, allows organisms or people to perceive and respond and interact to their environment. So it's just our body responding to the stimuli or the instances of what is going on around us to um, our nervous system, which is how our body responds. So my picture up here includes all five of the original senses. So we have touch, smell, hearing, taste, and sight. We're gonna start off with the sensory system for vision. So the visual sensory system. And this system helps us understand what's going on in the environment. It, it looks at the color, motion, shape, and orientation of objects in our environment. So when you are analyzing this either as an OT or looking at your child from your point of view, it's important to know that sometimes kids may miss the input that is being given to them. So if your kid is more of a they miss all the cues of what's going on around them. They're normally very clumsy. They look around. They don't see things that are happening. They're the kid getting hit with the, <laughs> the soccer ball or something outside on the playground. It might be due to a visual system um, dysfunction. So an easy modification in the house or in the school that I like to tell teachers is um, adding tape to places that are important. So maybe if you have multiple kids, it might be color-coded. If the child is it has a favorite color, that might increase their motivation to use it. But in schools, we commonly use it for when you're standing in line or they use the blocks that are on the ground in the school. But that is another way in the, in the household. It commonly use one for kids doing laundry would be having them put their clothes in the basket and it having like a colored rim on it. That's where they have to put it in that color. And then they, when they transition it into the laundry room, that they also put it where it's supposed to go. So you have a purple X on the washing machine and then a purple X on the dryer after that's done. And you have numbers that go from one to two, just as those visual reminders and visual cues. As kids get older, that might be a little less efficient as they may become more rebellious, stuff like that. But 
it's all about meeting them where they are. So it just depends on their level as well. The next one we have is the olfactory system. So that is your sense of smell. There is evidence that points us to that smell is the most powerful sensory system that we have with our memory compared to vision and our other senses. Um, this one is really good for students when it comes to studying. So my example I love to do is our teacher would give us Jolly Ranchers when we studied for our final exams. And when we took our exam, we used Jolly Ranchers as well. So it's combining multiple sensory systems, but that sense of smell for um, studying normally helps. Or even, our, some kids are too young, but maybe even for yourself, if you find yourself needing to know a certain kind of information either throughout the day or a week from now, if you have a coffee or the smell of brewing coffee at one time, um, when you're trying to remember that information and you have a coffee later that week, you'll remember that the, the situation that you were talking about or maybe even the list that you were trying to write that day. The next two I combined. So we have our auditory and vestibular system. The vestibular system is our inner ear that we have. That's why I have the picture of the inner ear on the slide, as well as our auditory system is just how we perceive sound, but them together regulate our movement, balance, and our coordination and allow us to know where we are with the force of gravity. So on the next slide, I have something, but. With our vestibular system, these children are more likely to seek that input versus um, avoid it. So when you're seeking a vestibular input, you're wanting to move around, you're wanting to jump, um, bounce, stuff of that nature. So in schools or even at home, um, modified seating is a good option to regulate this, this system for them. So I have an example of this right here. So the three that I decided to show, two of them can be used at school, but or all three of them can be used at school, but the one that I suggest for the home is the rocking chair. It has a flat base on the bottom, so it's not likely to tip over, but it creates that space where they can still move around. The ball chair is more of a individualized school chair that individuals can use, but it's still a good option for home, but it also works on your balance and your core strength. So it's a good overall technique if you have kids that are younger and are still growing. Then at the end, we have bouncy bands. So individuals with ADHD tend to have more of a seeking opportunity with vestibular the vestibular system. So you attach these bands to the bottom of a desk. They don't add any noise. And then you don't have the kids that are tapping their foot on the floor, but it also gives them that sensation to help them focus while they're studying or doing their reading, whatever it may be. The next one we have is the gustatory system. So that's our sense of um, tasting foods and flavors. Children that have an oversensitive gustatory system response would have difficulty with different temperatures and foods. So I have a big thing with textures as well. So when kids are saying, I really don't like this, it's normally because their system doesn't like it, not just because they don't like the flavor, but they could have this or they might just be messing with you. But you also might notice this about yourself and might just think it's normal, but it might just be due to a gustatory response. If you're under sensitive, you will have an extreme light for different condiments. So kids who eat the whole bottle of ketchup is very accurate or even the over seasoned French fries are very popular too. But this is also a sensory system that develops later. So babies are known for having this system being delayed as they like to explore the world with their mouth. Um, so they put objects in their mouth. That's why they say don't leave anything on the floor because they're going to explore it and then it becomes unsafe. One of the last two that I have is the tactile system or our sense of touch. Me as an OT, I love to use a sensory board or a sensory bin to help children explore um, the world in a safe and different kind of environment. Um, so the way we interact really allows our body to um, react in a normal or 
responsible way or accurate way. So we use pressure, texture, the temperature of things, and also pain. Um, this is important when children have experienced any form of trauma, um, as well as them trying to find comfort tools for different anxiety or depression symptoms. A lot of people, if they need the sensory input, will explore like weighted blankets. They've now come out with weighted hoodies, which are really cool. Um, but it also is just that part of understanding who your child is and understanding yourself if you're um, in need of that and creating that space to have that conversation. And the last one I have for this is the proprioceptive or where our body is in space. So this one combines all the other senses as it lets you know how to self-regulate, how your coordination works, um, any posture that you might have, your overall body awareness when you're participating in activity, your ability to focus, and even your speech. So we use all our entire body for this one system to work correctly. Um, when there are seeking behaviors or signs of a proprioceptive system dysfunction, these kids might be likely to be jumping, um, activities that like squishy tools such as um, sensory balls, as well as they enjoy bear hugs or even running around like crazy as they're just seeking all the input for their body. Um, they also have difficulty grading or justifying what amount of movement is needed. So these kids are often um, referred to as clumsy or they have messy handwriting. They just don't seem to have um, full coordination of their body, but there is also always different interventions you can do with these children that would benefit them overall. Okay, so we're going to combine all of this into developing your wellness and your child's wellness. So when it comes to your wellness, I have created a little separate worksheet on the side that you can use at home, but I want to go through every stage of wellness that we have. You as a parent would be able to control all three or all eight of these yourself because you have, you have gone through the education, you're working, you've had the kids, maybe not, but if you do this, all of these are covered. Your child, on the other hand, has to rely on you to be financially well, possibly spiritually well, even physically well, as they can't control which environment they are in, depending on their age. If they are older, they have more leeway with all of these, but specifically children from the age of birth to, I say, 17, 18. Um, so I want to go through social wellness first with your sense of connection, creating that space with the people you're working with or providing them with a safe and welcoming family or even friends. So maybe they don't have the best family situation, but having a teacher, a coach, finding them someone to talk to is important on their wellness, but also identifying your own social wellness. What kind of friends do you have? What kind of coworkers do you carry? Because a lot of people, we want to say we don't take work home with us, but it does through our emotions a lot. So finding that well balance is important for that system and that overall wellness in that area. I, as an occupational therapist, do work with people to get back to work, but I do not work with them just for work. So the occupational wellness is different from just having occupational therapy. It's your overall wellness with your satisfaction in your job and how the development you can have in that job. So where can you progress to and how what, how happy are you in that space? Um, children, while they're growing, it's creating that dream for them of they can be anything they want to be. And how can you show them that they can and what are you providing for them? Your financial wellness, this, this is more difficult, but thinking about the current and future financial situations you might have, there are things that are unpredictable, but how can we create a safe and open space for our kids to feel confident that they can go for what they want to achieve. Then we have that environmental wellness of building a household, a school, the school district's working really hard to try to do that, as well as like the doctor's office, are they comfortable there? Putting them in the right places 
to be well in that area. And the same for yourself. If you think that you might be happier or safer in a different home, a different place, moving to those places to make the best decision. Then we have our overall physical wellness. It is being physically active, your diet, sleep, and nutrition. A lot of OT is centered around your physical wellness. The certain goals are made for others, but physical, social, and emotional are the top three, I would say, for my version of and intellectual, depending on the day. And I just love working on physical wellness because sleep is often ignored and that is the most important occupation to me. Um, then we have intellectual wellness, recognizing your creative abilities and finding ways to expand on that knowledge. This one's really important for understanding where you are, like knowing it is okay that you have this level of education. What can you do with that education that's going to make you the most successful? It is okay that you are really good at art. Um, what can you do with that if you're not the best at school? It is finding those pathways that people would love and um, love to work on, but you just kind of get stuck in a spot where you don't know. And that's why being that example is the most important part. Then we have spiritual wellness, finding your sense of purpose and meaning in life, whether that is religiously spiritual or even just spiritually um, feeling well, like that over overwhelming feeling of being okay. Then we have the emotional wellness, which is those coping strategies that we use, satisfying and um, healthy relationships. I work on this a lot with how do we make healthy connections with people and how do we maintain them? This is especially hard with um, social media now being such a big aspect of our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but overall, emotional wellness is super important. But it's just a component. If one of these components is off, you're going to feel a strain on some part of your life, right? So when you're looking through this as a um, family, if you want to make a list, if you want to do it for yourself, you can just type in your notes, give yourself a scale. But I like to do it in a visual so I can have a chart on my wall or or not, you know, just depending on the day of reevaluating where my wellness is. So it's a good tool for you as well. You start at the bottom, either you can color it in, you can write a little X, give yourself a number and just grade yourself on, do you think you're in the job that you like? Do you think you have everything you've wanted in your occupation? If not, you can color it in at the bottom. Or if you think you're in a good place, you can color it even further. The goal is to have this circle all the way filled, right? But as you go through life and you have things that are added, taken away, I feel like you want to be in a happy zone. I feel like 50 all the way around, that's a happy zone because you can still function on a day to day, but you also have all the areas covered. But this is also a good one to do with your kids so you can have them have yours as an example, even though their financial might look different. Occupational may just be school for them because intellectual can be their craft. So if they're at into sports or if they're into theater or art, that can be their intellectual area. And if they want to pursue that and then their occupation can be school. That's where they're at most of the day. That's where a lot of focus and success comes from. And how do we work on that? So that's just a tool I wanted to provide all of you for your wellness. And then this is a list I have to break down what you can do. So number one would be identifying your strengths and weaknesses within your, your personal goals and your child's wellness. This could be a conversation you have with them. You could do it on your own time, but finding those strengths and highlighting those strengths within your household are really good for um, building that confidence to pursue emotional wellness overall. If there was any areas that were at, or there were any areas that were lacking in your wellness chart, how do you find that support? That would be your next step for your plan. Um, the school system definitely has a ton of resources. I'm sure they know how to get you in contact with people who would be able to offer support or even talking to other family members, asking them where they get their um, support from because there is no problem with asking for that support. 
And then getting in contact with them would be the next step as we want to go for little wins here, right? So having that support, identifying that we need it, and then getting that support. So then we want to keep it constant or consistent. So once you try to achieve that level of wellness, how can you keep it consistently? And how do you go from there? If you want more information on occupational therapy or just some of the things that I highlighted, there's a school mental health toolkit on the AOTA website. So it covers anxiety, things for classroom and recess. If there are signs that you're noticing with your child, just a little bit more about occupational therapy. If you, if you need more information on that, um, I have a QR code for you to scan as well as a direct link to the toolkit. If you need that but I'm so glad to have talked to you. If you have any questions, um, please drop them in the chat or, um, yes, thank you. That's good. Thank you. I have learned so much and I have been with you for a few months and, and yet we haven't gotten into these, uh, these discussions and this deep dive. Madison, your information on occupational therapy was really uh, well well articulated and and researched but i have to tell you before your talk i really didn't put together that occupational therapy and anxiety depression or or disordered eating had anything to do with each other you really helped us understand and put it together cindy there were no questions in the chat, but I was going to agree with what Dr. Turner said. I had no idea that outreach that an occupational therapist could provide. Um, when I think of occupational therapy, I think of somebody that m might have suffered, um, you know, some kind of physical uh, mm -hmm. illness or something. And occupational therapy would help to help them to recuperate and gain back the strength and the abilities that they had before. But you you went into a whole different realm that I had no idea that occupational therapists do. So so thank you. But the one comment that you that you made that that I think is great is that you know 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 your child and and it you can help them be the best that they can be. So mm -hmm. I I think that's really important. You said I'm sorry. Getting you to the best version of yourself is what you said. Super important. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, I really loved the strategies um, that you were talking about as far as food shopping and preparation and, and, and eating. And, you know, we're all so busy. We just grab this, grab that. You know, here you go. Let's take, let's go to this practice or whatever we're doing. But to really take the time and to understand how to manage your shopping. And that, of course, would help with, you know, what you're spending and, and just new, the whole nutritional oversight. So all the things that you've brought to light this evening uh, were, were really amazing. And having it aligned with occupational therapy is really uh, just something that is, I'm guessing, new for our community. I don't know if you know, but in our four years on Parent Academy, this is the first time we've had this topic. So uh, you, you've you really brought a yeah. new and, and wonderful and, and uh, something that really affects each and every one of us. Um, I liked when you talked about the sensory uh, areas, and my favorite was the bouncing bands on the desk. Because so many kids, you know, they're moving, they're listening, but they're kicking or they're bouncing and tapping. And just that little bounce with their feet would make all the difference. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting, the little things. Yeah. I've had a great um, time, honestly, yeah. and sharing it with all of you. Um, I can't wait to share more with all the people I meet along the way, honestly, so... I was glad to share. Oh, great. And we know that the places you will go will just be um, receiving such a wealth of information. So thank you for promoting our overall wellness, 
our children's wellness, and including not only diet and nutrition, but sleep. And we did have a parent academy on sleep. And it is so important. I don't care what age you are. And certainly our nutrition. You're a wealth of information. And we're so glad you presented tonight. And it has been a total pleasure working with you each day. Thank you. Uh, before we close out, anything else, uh, Madison, that you'd like to share? No, I've just had a great time and I'm so thankful for the opportunity, honestly. Um, I hope somebody gets a little nugget out of what I had to say and that they can use it later in the future. Very good. Cindy, any closing remarks? Uh, just want to remind everybody about our Rock Hill Schools Mental Health Hotline, 803-324-7464. Again, 803-324-7464. Seven four six four, and it's also in the chat. Thank you, Cindy. We always need to remind our our community. Also, I did want to mention that we will not be on next week because, as everyone knows, we are on spring break next week. However, we will be back two weeks from today for our next Parent Academy. So, thank you all of you for either tuning in tonight or perhaps tuning in later because you were getting ready for spring break. We have all of our Parent Academy from the last four years archived on our Parent Academy Facebook page. So please tap in and not only watch Madison Tarleton's wonderful presentation, but any of the other ones that may catch your eye. So we say good night, be safe, we will see you in two weeks. Enjoy your spring break. Good night, everyone.